This is the 2008 Dodge Poetry Festival. And this is Joe Weil. He's waiting for his turn to take the stage. This isn't the first time he's been a featured poet at the festival. In fact, he even made an appearance in the documentary Fooling with Words, hosted by Bill Moyers and shot at this very location. The difference is, this year, Weil had two books of his poetry published, and there seems to be a steady buzz growing around him. He's currently a professor at Binghamton University in New York, a world away from the factory work he's used to. We met up at his old high school in the working class port city of Elizabeth, New Jersey. It's a small inner city brick structure. It's been here since 1913. My grandmother went here. I learned a lot. The nuns were tough. It was a good place to become a writer. There's an Irish tradition that you're never, it's never said, well, because you're working class or working in a factory, you can't read proofs. There's none of those dividing lines in that sense. There's plenty of classism, but there, there aren't those dividing lines. A life of the mind is possible. And when I went into the factory, I continued to read. And it's great working at 12 to 8. I tell my students to have a mindless job. It's great for a writer. Because your, all your energy, your creative input isn't going into the job. You're doing it through muscle memory. And the job was skilled. I was a tool maker. But it didn't take my creative energy. And so I would write at night. The foreman, one foreman would let me write as long as I told stories. I let him tell stories about his growing up in Pittsburgh. And he'd start singing songs. And, you know, and then sometimes he'd threaten to fire me. He was moody. But, um, and I just kept doing readings. And I, I kept plugging away, as they say, 90% of success is the idea of showing up. I showed up. If Joe has a muse, it's Elizabeth. And while you can now hear his poems at festivals and on university campuses, there's something to be said for hearing them in their natural habitat. One of her fashionable high heels lies on a manhole cover. The other still attached to her twisted foot. To what odd dignity did she aspire? That sun, too, was a bright, bright yellow, and she remembered that the young men always grew shy or overly brave in her presence. Some hung their shaggy heads as if to lay horns in her lap. Still others capered about, performed their most elaborate courtship dances. And where was she walking to in that bright yellow sun? And was her odd, her freakish, her comical death, so much more vulgar than all the millions of DNRs, than the bored grandchildren yawning at the funeral, this basic business of death. That is stunning. Like that? Oh, I was thank an English you. teacher, so. Thank you. Whoa. I never believed that you can call yourself a poet. Somebody else has to do it, and then you either agree or disagree with them. Um, I, I tell my students all the time, you have to like at least 50 things better than poetry. Good slice of thin crust pizza, the, a kiss you had in, like, when you were 14. All these things, because if you don't, what do you write about? When I first met him, he was a machinist, and he was a shop steward, and uh, head of his union, and he was uh, always in conflict with uh, management. Uh, and now that, that political situation was just you know, loaded for him. It was very satisfying in a lot of ways, but it was also, um, it was kind of like a bondage because his real life, in a sense, was as an artist, but he had committed himself to this life of union and um, uh, blue collar uh, labor. And so making that move was a major transition for him, major transition. But you felt all along that this was somebody who really 
yearned to be an artist and who, who uh, knew what it was. The first time I got up early and put my work boots on and knew that they meant work. I was 18, freshly dropped out of college. And I came downstairs to join my father in the kitchen. He'd lost his larynx the year before, had learned to belch out words without a voice box. He stood there in his white stone products uniform, and I stood there in my work boots, and he just cried. My relationship with my father was my most problematical. My mother, pure gold, you know, I said Irish mother, you know. So therefore, it's hard to write about her. It took me 30 years to write a good, my father, on the other hand, it just comes pouring out. We sat for an hour on the porch, letting the tiredness drink us. The warm night touch us with its fur. He said, I'm sorry. I said, what are you sorry for? He didn't answer, just opened another beer. I wanted to kiss him, but I didn't. There were these blanks between us, as beautiful and as hopeless as the sky. There were these blanks. And what could we have filled them with? Later, when he was too drunk to walk, I helped him up the stairs, took his work shoes off, cleaned the snot from his throat hole, covered him with a blanket. This was love. I meant it, silent, and knowing it could kill me. I took my time. He loved me, I loved him, but he was a pain, the gluteus maximus, in a lot of ways, moody, volatile, all right, a factory worker that worked 12-hour shifts six days a week, all right, just about to make ends meet. You know, my mother worked sometimes, but basically she's a housewife, and he had it rough, you know, and so did we. <laughs> you know? All right, this poem's called Painting the Christmas Trees. The title's pretty self-explanatory. I spent a summer working in a Christmas tree factory basically running a machine that spit the paint onto the ends of the boughs. Uh, the kind of job that makes you think there are worse things than being homeless, which I also did periodically, but uh, we're in a nice location to read this poem, and this is what made me a labor activist and made me realize what people had to do in this country to survive. In my odyssey of dead-end jobs, cursed by whatever gods do not console, I end up at a place that makes fake Christmas trees. Thousands, some pink, some blue. One that revolves ever so slowly to the strains of silent night. Sometimes out of sheer despair, I rev up its RPMs and send it spinning wildly through space. Dorothy Hamill disguised as a balsam fir. I run a machine that spits paint onto wire boughs, each length of boughs a different shade, color-coded so that America will know which end fits where. This is spray paint of which I speak. No ventilation, no safety masks, lots of poor folks speaking various broken tongues, a guy from Poland with a ruptured disc lifting 50-pound boxes of defective parts. A Haitian so damaged by police interrogation, he flinches when you raise your arm too suddenly near. And all of us hating this job, knowing it's meaningless, yet singing, cursing, telling jokes, unentitled to anything but joy. The Lord, unreasonable joy that sometimes overwhelms you even in a hole like this. It's a joy rulers mistake for proof of the human spirit. I tell you, it is Kali. The great destroyer, her voice singing amidst butchery and hate. It is Rachel, the inconsolable, weeping for her children. It goes both over and under the human spirit. It is my father crying in his sleep because he works 12-hour shifts six days a week and can't make rent. It is 110 degrees in the land of fake Christmas trees. It is Blanca Ramirez keeling over pregnant signs, green card. It is a nation that has spiritualized shopping not knowing how many lost to the greater good of retail. It is Marta the Packer rubbing her crippled hands with Lord's water and hot chilies. It is bad pay and worse diet and the minds of our children turned on the wheel of sorrow. No language to leech this from the blood. No words to draw it out. A fake Christmas tree spinning wildly in the brain. And who can stop it? Who? Unless grief grows a hand and writes this poem.
Things are looking up. I mean, it's strange. You never think you're going anywhere. Your life is a continuum. My consciousness is basically the same since I was four years old and banging a pot in the backyard while I was watching my grandmother pull in laundry from the clothesline. But according to the world, I've made this success. He's managed to um, step into the world that he's, I think, really wanted he, and uh, is, is now um, teetering on a place where he's maybe in that world more than in Elizabeth, which is a problem for him. But I think he'll find a way. Okay. <laughs> the festival's terrific. It's a wonderful thing to do for poetry because people are so afraid of it and apprehensive of poetry. They, 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 they don't realize how much it comes from the roots of just daily experience. And I remember this poem by Jimenez, and it is my poem, and it is my only revolution. I am like a child who they drag through the fiesta of the world. My eyes cling madly to things, and what misery when I am torn away. I uh, spent, I didn't talk until I was fairly older, and I spent a lot of time just staring intensely at things. Poetry does bear a relation to both silence and sloth. My two necessary assets. I tell the students, if you're good at doing nothing and being quiet for long periods of time, you can enter the language as a poet. And uh, that's about the ferocity of, of looking at things, of witnessing to things. And I always love that poem by Jimenez. And it's just that little short poem. But it, to me, it, it is a revolution to know that you can cling fiercely to the things that you see and witness them. <laughs>